All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Save the best for last. <laughs> Thanks for sticking it out. It's, uh, so I'm Oliver Friedrichs, founder and CEO of Phantom. Uh, we're a new app, app framework partner here at Palo Alto, if you guys remember from uh, Tuesday when they announced the uh, app framework, uh, the uh, cloud-based platform to provision and deploy uh, enterprise-grade security software. I'm going to let the rest of the folks here introduce themselves. Lucas? Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for sticking around. Yeah, we were joking about last session of the last day and stoked that we've got so many folks here today. Uh, Lucas Moody, CISO at Palo Alto Networks and fellow security practitioner. Look forward to sharing with you our experience with Phantom. Yeah, hi. Um, too loud. <laughs> Um, hi everyone, I'm Saurabh. I'm a CTO and co-founder of Phantom, and I'll be helping these guys out as uh, we do the talk. Great. So let me tell you a little bit about Phantom. So we're a security automation and orchestration uh, company. How many of you are familiar with, with that or Phantom? Okay. So pr pretty good handful. Uh, well, I'm here to tell you more and also talk a little bit about how Palo Alto has benefited from the technology uh, since becoming a customer as well. So thanks, Lucas, for joining us and, and being willing to talk to the, the folks in the room here. So let me start by showing you a scary picture. Uh, we have over 1,500 security products in our industry today. You know, every time you go to RSA, there's yet another assembly line of point products that we keep producing in the industry almost on a daily basis, right? And part of this is clearly as Nir mentioned on Tuesday, being perpetuated by the fact that the venture capital community just keeps creating more and more security vendors. And so we're almost drowning in products. There are so many products out there. You know, I've been in the space for over 20 years. I can't even tell you what half of these companies do anymore, right? It's, it's really overwhelming. Uh, and in addition, there's almost like this security circle of life, right? Companies get bought, three people from that company go out and start another company insecurity and it just keeps growing and growing. So it's a good problem to have, right? Everyone's well-intentioned. I don't think anyone goes and tries to create security products with you know, the wrong intentions, um, but it does create a problem in the large enterprise where you have uh, just this growing number of complexity and the typical large enterprise has 30, 40, 50 security products that they're trying to manage, right, in their environment and a whole room full of people to try to manage them. So and that's, that's what we're trying to solve. So this is an interesting statistic. We surveyed about 125 large enterprises and found that 75% of them admit to regularly ignoring security alerts. What that means is that there are alerts and uh, threats that are being detected, or uh, some of them could be false positives, but we believe most of them are probably true positives, and they're not being reacted to because people are overwhelmed. The volume and velocity of security threats that we see on a daily basis continue to increase to the point where we just can't keep up. And it's not getting better anytime soon. So in addition to this, we have a number of other issues. Uh, we saw uh, some of this in previous talks here as well, where we have over a million people missing in the workforce today who we need to be able to staff our open security uh, positions across uh, both the US and internationally. Right? That's a lot of people. We talked about the product problem. There are so many products now that it's hard to keep up. At the same time, many of those products are static. They don't talk to each other. There's, there's no actual communication or fabric connecting these products together where uh, product A from product vendor A talks to product B from product vendor B, right? It just rarely, rarely ever happens. Um, there have been efforts to try to solve that, but really very few of them have actually succeeded uh, up until now. So the static nature of our security controls provides this additional challenge of, you know, all of these products are installed, it's set and forget, and nobody's managing them in a cohesive way. Speed of response needs to improve. Uh, typical human response time to a, an alert or an event is 10 minutes best case, 11 hours worst case. Right, that's pretty pathetic. It's not very fast. And then cost keeps going up, right? We keep investing and spending more and more in the security space today as we buy more and more of these products. So this is where orchestration comes in. You know, if you think about security and the entire 
uh, ecosystem as an OODA loop, somewhat of a military term, observe, orient, decide, and act. And you look at the first column here, for decades we've been building point products to detect and prevent security threats, right? You have firewalls, IDSs, antivirus, mobile virtual cloud-based security products that fall into that first category. Now for about 15 years we've been building connectors out of those products into analytics tools like your SIMs, Splunk, ArcSight, QRadar, Elasticsearch, Hadoop, everything else that we've been deploying to digest and ingest those alerts and actually distill them, condense them, correlate them, and produce some high fidelity result. The challenge though is the next two columns, decision making and acting, have seen very little investment in the security space over the last 15 years or so. And uh, this is now where we're struggling. Again, our people can't keep up. Tier one SOC analysts, right, they'd, they'd rather do almost anything else than be a tier one because the volume of alerts that you're seeing just is not going to stop anytime soon. So what if we can automate a lot of that routine route tier one uh, analyst work into repeatable playbooks that you can use and uh, uh, put to work for you instead of having someone, an individual, who, who actually has to go and pivot between all of these products. Right? That's really where Phantom starts. And the second piece of this is how can we connect to all of the southbound APIs or the interfaces that we've built into the world security products today that didn't exist 10 or 15 years ago and start to instrument these products in the environment so that we can now orchestrate all of those existing products that you've invested in, uh, already paid for, but that don't work together. That's one of the promises of orchestration is building this layer of connective tissue between the entire security world to tie all of these products together so that you can now marshal all of their power together as one platform right, versus having uh, dozens of discrete uh, army of point products that all work independently. The other way to look at this is all about SOC maturity. Now, how many of you work, work in the Security Operations Center for your companies? Okay, so a few of you. Uh, SOC maturity is all about how do you advance your Security Operations Center from a maturity standpoint. We start at level one. Level one is kind of, okay, great, we've got some analysts and security engineers. They're looking at alerts. They're doing random things when they see those alerts, but there's no defined standard operating procedure on what they should be doing or what they are doing when they see an alert, right? That's hopefully not where you guys are at. It's, uh, you know, you're just building a SOC. It might be a new company, and so you're just putting a team together. Level two is where you have some repeatable operating procedures, but they're all manual, right? They may be, you may have a case management system or a ticketing system where you're putting incidents or alerts or events when you see them, but then you're responding manually when you see an alert or an event. Level three is you've really uh, improved the definition of your standard operating procedures. You've documented pretty much everything that an analyst should do when they see an event or an alert. It might be in a wiki, it might be in a Word doc, it might be in SharePoint or, or some other system that's tracking this, uh, but it's still largely manual. Level four is where you start automating those standard operating procedures and actually start driving those uh, procedures through machine automation versus largely uh, pointing and clicking and poking as you execute those activities and those actions. And then level five is really a, a sophisticated high level of automation. And the interesting thing is this is remarkably similar to building self-driving cars where you're automating uh, the driving of a car you know, I, I wouldn't say that, you know, we're trying to build autopilot or anything like that where you've got something like an AI driving your security decisions, right? That's scary. Um, but we are talking about taking standard operating procedures that are well-defined, making them repeatable, and then executing them with or without human oversight, right? And that's something that you can decide on yourselves. So our goal is to advance the maturity level of your SOC and your security operations center through the use of automation. And that's, that's one of the values of, of this technology. So here's a, a simple uh, scenario, uh, and Lucas is gonna walk through a, a far more detailed one. But in this case, we have a infected endpoint that might be emanating CNC activity to the internet. It's detected by a Palo Alto network device. 
that then triggers a playbook in Phantom. The first thing that we might do is, because it's a virtual machine, connect to VMware, take a memory snapshot. At that point, we might run a forensic tool in the snapshot, grab the, uh, the malware out of memory, get the file off of the endpoint using Active Director or WMI to get the uh, to file off the endpoint, submit it to Wildfire, Palo Alto Network Sandbox, for example, to see is it really bad. If it is, we might block the IP on the network and then terminate the process on the endpoint. Right? This is a, a pretty routine type of use case that you might implement. At any step of the way, you might have a human in the loop to decide, do I want to go to the next step? Right? But clearly, accelerating this saves a, sig a significant amount of time. The second example is more of a, an email-based example where we have a suspicious email sent to a, the company's spam or phishing mailbox that triggers a playbook in Phantom. The first thing it might do, the orchestrator, is take the file detonated in wildfire. If it's bad, we might block the hash uh, on the endpoint using uh, Windows, software restriction policy, for example, or an endpoint agent if you have one. Then we might do a reputation lookup on the URL in the email, block the URL on the network, on uh, the Palo Alto Network's firewall, and then delete the email from everyone else's mailbox, right, so that they can't even click on it once we know it's bad. So again, good example of, of you know, how you would automate a routine type of use case. So this is really what uh, Phantom and, and security automation in general can provide right, to be able to automate these types of, of use cases. So let me uh, show you a little bit about um, what Phantom looks like from a product standpoint, and then I'll hand it over to Lucas to walk you through uh, a real world scenario. Uh, we provide uh, a platform that's freely available uh, in a community edition. So any of you, when you, when you leave the room, can register uh, on our website, phantom.us, to download this. The community gives you access to both the software download, it's a virtual machine image that you run in your, in your data center, typically uh, beside your SIM or your data lake or any other system that can send data to Phantom. Uh, the community provides resources like newsletters, uh, videos on how to set up the software, knowledge base, and so on. The other thing we provide is an app store. Um, today we connect to about 130 distinct security products across the industry. Everything from Palo Alto products like Autofocus, Wildfire, Panorama, uh, we're, we're adding uh, more every day, to third-party products, uh, common EDR products that run on the endpoint like Tanium, Carbon Black, CrowdStrike, and others, uh, cloud-based security technologies that you use in your SOC like VirusTotal, Domain Tools, uh, PassiveTotal, uh, OpenDNS, and so on. Everything with an API, our mission is to integrate with it so that you can now orchestrate uh, those APIs and those products from uh, the orchestration platform. Uh, one thing you can do is look for specific products. You know, here's an example. Uh, while Autofocus Wildfire and Palo Alto Networks Firewall are supported out of the box. Uh, we have this app, this notion of apps that tie Phantom together with the rest of the world's security APIs. Uh, apps are Python modules, so what we've seen is that a lot of folks and companies and customers and partners have actually built their own apps to be able to extend our platform to connect to really interesting things. Uh, for example, the U.S. Navy Spaywar wrote an app for the Floodlight SDN controller so that they could control SDN network flows through, through Phantom. Um, other partners like Worldwide Technology have written apps for uh, F5 or Cisco Meraki or, or other types of, of products. So we're seeing this velocity in the community growing around this as well. Uh, and we continue to have more and more submissions on new products being added almost, almost every week. The other thing that we provide is playbooks. Uh, so apps, if you think about it, provide the connectivity between Phantom and third-party security technologies. Playbooks are the codification of your standard operating procedure in your, on your security team or in your SOC. Right? So these are the measures that your team might take when they see an event that need to be responded to. We provide uh, a number of playbooks out of the box that are samples. And when I drill into one of these, for example, here's a, a lost device response type of playbook. You can see what that playbook looks like and what it would do when you got a an alert, for example, 
on a lost device, lost mobile device perhaps, and how to respond. So the, the community site, again, any of you can register on this today, provides all of this where you can download the platform. Now let me show a couple of screenshots of the platform itself. Uh, let me start with the dashboard. You, know, you guys have probably seen 100 dashboards. I'm not going to uh, bore you with yet another one. But the interesting thing about this dashboard is we focus on how automation has contributed to your security team and provided value. So the first thing that you see at the top is really how much automation has benefited you. And in this case, uh, over the course of the last uh, few weeks, for example, this installation has contributed about 53 people, full-time heads, uh, 17 days of uh, automation time, and about $20,000. So the, the key is providing uh, not a replacement, right, for you guys and your teams, but augmenting you so you could actually focus on what's more important and th the things that do require human intellect and cognitive thinking versus cutting and pasting URLs between malware, cloud-based services, right, which, you know, it is, is not the best use of your time. Uh, the platform has a playbook editor, and Sorb's going to demonstrate this as well, uh, where you can build these complex workflows that literally tie together the inputs and outputs from the various APIs across the security environment. And this is a sample playbook about phishing, right, how you might respond to a phishing th uh, mail that you're finding in uh, an exchange mailbox. And the editor allows you to literally drag and drop these blocks and create a workflow uh, to execute on this at, at scale when these events come into your phantom instance. Uh, the other thing that we do is we actually compile that visual representation into Python code that's then run at really high speed across uh, a, an event stream that comes into the platform. So this allows really the ultimate flexibility. If you don't know Python, you can build a playbook uh, from scratch that does most of what you want to do. But if you have really complex decision making, like let's say you're a financial and you only want to do something to your CEO's laptop when it's not trading hours, right? you could implement that type of logic in here in Python because we may not be able to do all of that visually within the visual playbook editor. So that's one of the really cool things is the ability to, to dig in really deep and customize this to your environment. Uh, all of the connectors and the apps that are available are shown here. So I for, could, for example, extend this playbook. And as I'm extending it, I click on a block, I add a new block, and it gives me a full list of every product that I've now connected Phantom to that I might want to uh, incorporate into my workflow. So in this case, you know, I'm looking at a, a bunch here. They're kind of an alphabetical order. And I might want to add a ServiceNow action to create a ticket on my ServiceNow uh, ticketing system instead of actually blocking an IP. Because I might have a network team that won't let me yet configure my firewall to block the IP. So I'm going to at least push a ticket to ServiceNow so that I can get that team to now dispatch a block rule when, when they're ready, right, according to their process. So the, the ability to have people in the loop is really important, and, not, and we're not talking about just full automation. It's uh, a combined you know, human in the loop, on the loop, or out of the loop, depending on your tolerance for, for automating. And that's, that's really where a tier four analyst, and we see companies increasingly calling them these positions, tier, you know, we've heard about tier one, tier two, tier three. Um, we're seeing this new role, and it could just be the tier three, but it's, it's the automation engineer. It's the person who's responsible for creating these playbooks that are now automating a lot of the procedures within, within the organization. Um, that's where they live and play, is in the playbook editor. Now, as a tier one, this is where you would do a lot of your work, where you're actually triaging events and alerts that are coming into the platform. Now, we call this mission control, because everyone loves rockets. Uh, the goal is to provide you with a place where you can uh, essentially do your triage for a security alert. Now, let me walk you through the screen really quickly. On the left-hand side is an activity feed. So this is where you can collaborate with other analysts within your organization where you might be working on a particular event or incident. 
Uh, you'll see a history of which playbooks and actions ran. So in this case, I could see I ran this investigative playbook twice. You know, I asked, uh, Eric and I are working on this, so we asked him for help on this uh, foreign IP address. And I can also now point and click on any indicators that are up on the top there to drill down and more surgically run individual actions that I might need to execute. So I could click on, for example, an IP here, drill down and run a geolocate IP action because I've got MaxMind hooked up to the platform. So you can combine both the full playbook automation, I might have run this whole playbook, it might have actually closed the whole event, to having an analyst work in mission control here where they can surgically decide, I wanna go and close this, and I've got more work to do because automation didn't really take care of all of it. So each product we integrate with typically has real estate here, so you would see you know, all of the results from the queries that were made in this screen, on this screen, and uh, essentially this is where tier one analysts would, would live and play. So that's really the platform. I'm gonna hand it over to Lucas now, who is actually uh, probably better at explaining this than I am. We'll see about that, thank you. Thank you, Oliver. So um, what, uh, what I was hoping to do today is to take what Oliver just shared and to make it real for us security practitioners. I've, I've gone through the same presentation and while it does a great job in laying out the problem statement and how the product uh, envisions kind of the future of security operations, I think for us, um, it makes most, you know, the most sense to actually go through a real-time runbook uh, and, and flow through it that way to see how this can contribute to reduction in the total cost of operations for your SecOps teams. Um, so before I get into the actual runbook, um, I, I thought I'd share a quick story with you. Um, for those of you that don't know me, and that's most of you, I, I'm usually the guy in the bar after two drinks that's telling all these stories that everybody's already heard a hundred times. Uh, but since I don't know most of you, hopefully you haven't heard this one. Uh, so uh, a long time ago, uh, when I first met my wife, um, I met one of the coolest guys in the world. He's no longer with us, but her grand grandfather. Uh, and um, and you know he was an old World War II vet, super cool guy. He would take me fishing. We had this great relationship, but this guy had no idea uh, how technology worked. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, I got him his first computer. Uh, and I spent a lot of time with him setting it up, setting up Skype for him, uh, setting up uh, you know, his browser so that he can go and check email and all that stuff. And, um, and one of the funniest stories that I remember is we were both sitting down and I just showed him how to use Google. Uh, and we did like a Google search for something he was working on. Uh, and I showed him how to, how to switch over to images so that you can see pictures of what it is you just searched for. You know, old school stuff. And uh, he just sat back in his chair mesmerized. <laughs> And he looks over at me and he goes, man, you know what? This reminds me of when I was in the war. And I'm going, oh, here we go. Uh, and he goes, no, this guy, he had brought to me this thermos. And I'd never seen one before. Do you know what that is? And I'm going, of course, everybody knows what a thermos is, you know? And he goes, well, it keeps hot drinks hot and cold drinks cold. How does it know? <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, wow, you're, you're like legendary status as far as I'm concerned. But, and I'm being a little tiny bit hyperbolic here, that's actually the reaction I had the first time I got to see this product. Um, not so much because automation is cool and, and unique. It's not, we've been doing it for a long time. Uh, any, any of you that are security practitioners like I am, we used to go, we used to hire, you know, many armies of developers uh, to come and, and integrate our products, you know. Um, if we had workflows that were repeatable, uh, we would, you know, go to our engineers, uh, teach them the security product, uh, and they would go and make the magic happen on the back end. Uh, but the challenge was, when you do that, uh, as soon as you upgrade your product or as soon as the API changes or whatever else, uh, all of your automation breaks, breaks and you're relying upon the developers that you have. And if they leave, uh, you're kind of SOL. So when I think about this product and what it's done for us and it, what, it, what we believe it will do for us in the future, uh, that's what I'm thinking about. How do we build automation in that scales with the business, that grows with us, uh, that doesn't break every time you upgrade one of the products in your space. Um, and obviously this is a Palo Alto Networks conference. Hopefully most, you're, most of you are mostly on the Palo Alto Networks platform. Uh, and we believe we do a pretty darn good job of helping you to automate your security workloads within your own environments. Uh, but let's be real, uh, there's, there's no homogenous uh, security organization that, that, that sits on a single platform. Um, we don't at Palo Alto Networks, so it wouldn't be fair to assume that, that others do. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through a, secure, you know, a simplified security playbook. Uh, and we're doing that very intentionally. We're doing that intentionally to kind of run through what it may look and feel like. Hopefully it resonates with you. Hopefully this is similar to the work that you guys are doing. Uh, and then what we're going to do on that screen as we're doing it is Sarab is going to uh, go ahead and build a playbook in real time against uh, the, work, the, the use case that, I, that I'm describing in real time for you. Uh, so feel free to look over on that screen every once in a while. I'm going to run through some content on this one. And, um, and hopefully, um, you, you know, you guys have the same reaction that I did the first time I saw this. Uh, so you want to kick over? Yeah. You good? Yep. All right. So obviously, as a security ops practitioner, uh, for those of you that work in the SOC or have teams uh, that run monitoring or response for you, uh, that manage your prevention infrastructure, um, there's about a million different use cases you could probably think through. Uh, but the one that, that jives with me and, and one that I believe is really common and probably common amongst all of us are those malware cases. You get a malware alert. Um, generally speaking, if you've got Palo Alto Networks, it means that you're probably already mitigated. There, all, there are circumstances where there's downstream work to be done. Uh, and so I'm going to run through this example. So uh, in, in, on the top right-hand side of that screen, you'll see a clock. Uh, what I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do my best to track the length of time it takes uh, for your analyst or your ops person to run through these tasks. Um, I've done my best not to be too liberal in the time uh, that I apply to it, so feel free to call me out. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, uh, the, the story will, will resonate. So you get this malware alert. Um, generally speaking, your, your uh, SOC might get this in the form of a ticket, in the form of an email alert, uh, perhaps uh, by watching a dashboard. Uh, whatever that case may be, um, there's a lot of work and there's a lot of context building that goes into actually mitigating said case, right? Uh, there's a lot you need to do. You need to pull contextual detail. Uh, you need to understand uh, you know, the, the downstream potential impact of the malware. You need to figure out where, it may, where else it may live. Um, if you're going to use an EDR to understand uh, the potential footprint of this malware in your environment, uh, you're going to need IOCs and so on and so forth. Uh, and that really begins for your teams. It begins with going and understanding what that context is. So you may look at a report. In this example, we're looking at a wildfire report. And in this report, you're going to get uh, details on dynamic analysis, static analysis, uh, what are the IPs that are pooled uh, that this malware calls out to, uh, what are the other behavioral things that occur. Uh, and from that, you're going to develop a list of likely you know, indicators, IOCs. And these indicators are really important for you for a couple of reasons. One. Um, as you do further research, you're trying to figure out, well, is this unique to me? Is this something that somebody else has seen before? If it's unique to me, obviously that's going to drive up the severity level uh, of your response, right? Because it might be targeted versus something that's opportunistic or, or generally speaking in the wild. Uh, you need the IOCs to, to peruse your environment, uh, to understand where else it may live. You've got this one hit, uh, but perhaps this lives elsewhere in your environment. Hopefully, you're not hearing this for the first time. We all go through this all the time, right? Uh, from there, you're going to do further research and build more context. Uh, you're going to check malicious IPs and URLs against whatever tools you have. That may be some threat intelligence provider, maybe some public-facing tools. Uh, it may be pulling from autofocus or a tool like that, if you're a customer of such. Um, and again, you're collecting this information over time to build the right context in how you're going to contain and mitigate uh, said threat in your environment. So it's important that you do this, and all of this takes time. At this point, uh, uh, not being liberal in the time I applied, we're looking at like 12 minutes so far. Moving on, you might leverage some outside tools that all of us love, know and love, like VirusTotal. Uh, you start pushing this to understand further context. Uh, has it been seen before? Um, what, you know, how does AV react to it and so on? Um, at which point, now you're going to start doing some additional analysis within your own space. Now that you've got detail uh, on the malware or, or said incident, you're going to start searching through whatever tools you have internal to your environment. It could be Elk, could be Splunk. Uh, in the screenshot that I'm showing you here, uh, we're perusing Panorama. Uh, but whatever the case, again, uh, you're searching your environment for traffic that matches the indicators that, that were involved. Uh, and now we're at about 19 minutes. Moving on, you're going you're gonna to search your, your endpoints. So now that you've got your IOCs, if you happen to be a Tanium shop, 
Uh, you can push that workload out to your endpoints within your environment to understand, do I see this elsewhere, right? So your, your end user workstation um, uh, uh, population needs to be queried. There's many ways to do that. Tanium is, is what we use internally, uh, and that gives us near real-time results on where else does this live. And you're going to move on. You're going you're to move on to actually understand the assets now. So now that you've got your footprint, say you've got three machines that you've seen this indicator on, um, what are those machines? Are they enterprise servers? Are they workstations? Are they virtual machines that are somehow in support of your enterprise applications, or is it sitting under somebody's desk? Uh, you've got to understand context. You've got to understand where. You've got to understand potential impact. And uh, you, you have to understand what data may reside wherever said malware is deployed. That doesn't happen instantly. You've got someone who's doing that research, right, uh, spinning up to do all of these queries. Moving on, so you've got your footprint, you understand the potential impact, you understand what operating system is running at said uh, endpoint or endpoints. Um, now you may want to do some forensics work. Um, and um, I don't think that's uncommon to most of, or to, to the work that we do as security practitioners, right? So now you're thinking about doing things like pulling a memory image, or perhaps you're getting a disk image, or if it's a virtual machine, like on the right hand side here, you may want to pull a snapshot. Uh, in either case, time-consuming events that don't necessarily require high IQ, uh, but you need a practitioner to go and do this stuff if you're going to do that downstream work. And it doesn't end there. Now you've got to get into your containment business, right? You've got to go and quarantine boxes. You've got to push things off onto quarantined VLANs, or you need to, um, in some cases, block outbound communications. Maybe you're pushing... Um, uh, uh, a block to your EVLs and your Palo Alto Networks product, uh, or perhaps you've got a custom solution where you're doing DNS black holing or something like that. Whatever the case is, again, downstream work. And at this point, we're past 40 minutes. This is for one, in, uh, one incident. And then finally, you're at your remediation phase. Okay, let's assume that this, this example that I gave wasn't super high impact. It impacted one, uh, maybe, employee workstation, and that, that employee works in, uh, you know, in a role that's not super critical in terms of having access to critical data. So we're going to push this out for a, a classic re-image. Um, some folks may have this, this automated, uh, but generally speaking, you have to engage a service desk or something like that, right? Uh, and that requires a ticket. Again, that takes time. So we've gone through this very typical security use case one that we see on a day-in, day-out basis, or most of you likely. Um, and um, at least according to my clock, if you're not calling me out on the time that I applied to each one of these steps, we're at about 47 minutes, right? 47 minutes for the detect, analyze, contain, and remediate phases of the work that we had to go through in a very typical um, uh, security incident, right? And so that's for one case. Now, you multiply this by how many incidents are you having in your environment? Ten a day? I don't know. Uh, you know, at Palo Alto Networks, we, we never see malware because all of our products block every, everything from getting in, but you know, your, your experience may vary. I got one laugh. Thank you. Uh, this is a Palo Alto Networks conference. So, uh, but, but whatever the case, you've got, you've got the 47 minutes that, that you've contributed to this, and to the point Oliver was making earlier today, you know, I mean, we've got all these other challenges. Um, you know, I'm the CISO at Palo Alto Network, so I'm doing security for a security company. Uh, but like you, it's a tough job. It doesn't matter where you work, right? It's tough for a million different reasons, some of which Oliver articulated. One, it's hard to find talent in this space. You know, folks want to do some cool, meaningful work. Um, there's every company in the world is looking for the same folks that we're trying to hire. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we've got to find a way to reduce the attack surface, reduce the upfront workload, so that we're hiring people not only to the degree that we've got you know, the jobs that we can actually fill with the talent pool, but we also have to think about how are we going to give them meaningful work. <laughs> like, like, like was mentioned earlier, uh, folks don't want to come out of school into a SecOps role or out of their five-year career into a SecOps role where a majority of their jobs are doing the things that I just showed you. It doesn't jive with anybody. They may do it for two uh, to six months, but at some point, they're going to get bored. 
And you need, to, you need to ensure that you're creating an environment where they're gonna be challenged and they're focusing on the right thing and, and ultimately are driving risk reduction in your environment that, in a way that they can feel proud of. And, and this is the way to do it. It's around automation. Uh, you, you can't promise the types of attacks you're gonna see, uh, but what you can do is, is ensure these folks that you're bringing on who want to, to change the world in whatever way they can in security, that they're focused on things that are actually gonna make an impact in your space. Um, and then, you know, to take it a step further, you know, I had mentioned earlier the, the automation problem. It's a tough one. Um, I've done a lot of automation. You know, I've, I've, I've had a long uh, history, in, and I come from the ops uh, background myself. I was a network ops guy early in my career. I did SecOps for a long time. I was at eBay PayPal uh, for seven years during eBay PayPal's big second spike, where we saw attacks from Anonymous, Syrian Electronic Army, criminal underground groups in Romania that w wanted to, to defraud users on our platform. Um, and the automation that we did required constant upkeep and maintenance. Uh, fortunately, uh, one of our automation guys is with us here at Palo Alto Networks now, but the point remains, it's really tough, and it really requires a dedicated workforce on the engineering side if you want to get it right, uh, and that's not the right way to do it. This is the right way to do it. So um, as I was running through that, Sarab, so hopefully you're finished or close yeah. to finished. Yeah, I'm done. Uh, but those of you that would have been perusing the screen on your left, uh, would have seen him building the playbook that I just described. Um, and so think about that. For those of you that are reporting to boards of directors or your e-staff, uh, and those of you that need to make a, bi a business case for security, think about how you can show uh, in a very meaningful, um, intangible way the reduction in the total cost of operations for security by automating the things that people don't want to touch anyway so that you're only focused on the critical few and you're focused on those things that are truly gonna help your companies remain safe in this crazy digital age. Thank you. Thank you. So as he was talking through the use case, I was building the playbook on the screen. Um, I can quickly walk through what the playbook is, but you get the idea. Uh, whenever malware is detected on the endpoint, you get an event. Um, here in this, I'm looking up wildfire and retrieving the report. Uh, and then I kick off investigation. I'm hunting on autofocus and using Tanium as um, an EDR tool in order to hunt within my environment if I've seen that malware or not. Uh, I'm hunting the IP address, whether that has been seen in autofocus and Tanium or not. Uh, then I query virus total for uh, reputation lookup. Uh, then I try to find whether the IP has been seen on Panorama in its uh, logs that it has captured. I, see, I try to find whether the domain has been seen in the Panorama logs. Um, I try to find uh, enough information about the endpoint, uh, doing WMI queries of the, uh, of the end system as well. And then I try to figure out whether this is a VM or not, right? So I uh, query virtual uh, vSphere infrastructure. I find out whether the VM is, uh, if, if this IP address corresponds to a running VM or not. If it is, then I trigger a snapshot to preserve the state of the machine as, uh, as soon as possible under, uh, under attack, right? So that I can preserve the state for forensic investigation. Um, and then I, uh, if it is not a VM, then I would use Tanium and deploy its action in order to acquire the image. Uh, Tanium can figure out whether this is, what kind of endpoint it is, and it has an ability to retrieve the image. Uh, the data that is being collected, like report that has been pulled down from wildfire or VM image that has been pulled down or uh, Tanium, uh, Tanium's image that has, been, uh, leveraging Tanium, the image that has been pulled down is all saved in a secure vault on the, uh, on the platform itself so that you can go back and investigate at any point in time. Um, we even support uh, executing forensic tools like uh, volatility. So if you download a VM image, you could, you could have further extended this use case to do even forensic. Uh, and then on the basis of the file reputation results or any of the other uh, investigation that I've done, I could then decide what do I want to do? Do I really want to go into quarantine or, and remediate? Or uh, you know, how do I want to end my resolution of this workflow? So, uh, in this case, I'm using uh, Tanium's, uh, uh, you know, package to quarantine um, the endpoint. I'm taking the attacker IP address and adding it to uh, a, a list, which is then exposed as uh, something Panorama then can consume using the dynamic list capability. 
I could have very well pushed this IP address as a block IP address directly on uh, PAN or any other firewall that you might be working with. So uh, because Panorama supports a very convenient way of blocking blacklists of IPs and domains, this is a much more convenient way because these lists can then be managed externally from the platform. You can monitor how these lists are growing and you can uh, constantly up update these lists as well from uh, your outside processes. And then I take all the information from all the investigation hunting that I've done. I format a nice description with all the results of all the investigation that I've done, and then I create a ticket uh, in ServiceNow saying, here's all the information about uh, this incident that occurred. Go ahead and reimage the endpoint. And that's the end of the playbook. Now, the beauty of this playbook compared to what an analyst would have been doing um, with either scripts on his uh, machine or uh, through by virtue of logging into various consoles is that it is a error prone, you know, fat fingering, fatigue, or whatever might be the case. Uh, it is non-repeatable. Um, you know, it, it, somebody has to follow the process, and you know, somebody would overlook our steps once in a while. Uh, and more importantly, this is everything that is executed on behalf of this playbook is recorded onto the platform. You can go and look at up uh, that this incident when it occurred three months ago. What was the analysis results of the entire investigation? Why did you ended up ended up taking a particular action? Whether you uh, allowed the threat to be, or you, uh, you know, you deleted the image, uh, the file on the endpoint, or uh, you did nothing, right? I mean, whatever the outcome might have been, you would be able to look back at the history of the execution of this playbook um, and conclude and uh, reason why you did what you did, which is a very important point where, because you know, on day one, probably none of the vendors. Uh, might be in a position to definitely call something bad, and that might be your reason to not block it or not remediate, and you just had ended up creating a ticket. Um, and, and you know, this this playbook can further be extended where you're monitoring the state of the ticket, so that when the ticket gets closed, only then you close the incident. So it provides a complete feedback loop, which again was very hard, or is extremely hard in current environment where. You know, you have segregation of security functions, security teams, and IT teams where, you know, all you do is toss the ball over the IT side and say, okay, go block this IP address. And you have no idea whether they really indeed blocked it or not. You have no idea whether the attack was mitigated. Um, and you rely on your alert counts to go down. That's your only, um, you know, saving grace um, when you're responding to an incident. But here, you can um, be far more uh, sure and certain, and this process can be repeated without any errors more consistently, more repeatedly, and more importantly, at machine speed. So people are not going and logging in to different consoles. Um, and, and lastly, you know, as we are exercising all the corresponding apps and connectors to talk to all of these devices, uh, the platform provides the, uh, the assurance of um, making sure that the apps and connectors are kept up to date with regards to the updates that might be happening on the third party technology. So you don't have to hire a Tanium expert who knows all the Tanium interfaces in order to write the scripts, and when he leaves, you have no idea what that script does. Your credentials are on those scripts, so it's, it's just a mess, right? I mean, there is, no, um, there is no discipline in how these processes are being implemented. There is no maintenance, there's no platform, there's no, um, there's no integrity in, in the process, and this platform provides you a full audit trail of, uh, of seeing what the playbook is, how it has evolved, how it has changed, Everything that it did is recorded. So it provides a, f a much more uh, sophistication, improved level of sophistication in your SOC operations. Any questions? Right. I we're was, we're uh, glad ready. the demo worked. Yeah. So good job. Yeah, thanks. Any questions? While I was uh, building the playbook, anything came to your mind? Sure. Yeah. Can you do it the reverse? In other words, <laughs> if you had a Python script. All right. Well, that's that's uh, injuring. Uh, yeah. I'm loud anyway. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. Can you do it the reverse, where you bring in a Python script and it'll build out the model? Uh, no. Uh, I think that that would be a Nirvana, right? I mean, to be able to visually generate, uh, you know, a model out of a Python script, which could be built anyway. Yeah, uh, if you so figure that out, come come talk to yeah. us. Yeah, <laughs> I'm on it. You're hired. <laughs> Any so. other questions from the audience? So we have a. Uh, we only have one of these. They're actually very hard to come by. Uh, a Phantom Lego sock kit. So you guys can actually 
you know, pretend you're working in a phantom sock. So the ne next question gets the, gets the sock hit. <laughs> <laughs> anyone? anyone? <laughs> that doesn't get has to, to be a real there. question. Has to be a real question. <laughs> Come on. And, and they can't work for Palo Alto. Network. Yeah, well. I just had a question around the community-driven uh, contribution, and how is Palo Alto Networks leveraging that in Phantom? Uh, well, that's a good question. We happen to have the guy that runs the Security Operations Center right behind you, but I'll do my best to answer on your behalf. So um, the, way, the way that the community works, um, and this is one of those, I mean, we talked about it earlier, but we kind of breezed through it. We had a lot of content to get through. Uh, but one of, the, one of the aspects that makes Phantom so magical is, is kind of the openness of the platform. So if you think about folk like you guys, you know, somebody over here maybe automating, I don't know, an email uh, response or, or a, you know, a spoof at response playbook. Uh, we may be developing a, a malware response playbook. Perhaps you've got a very unique use case that only applies to e-retail, I don't know. You know, think of, uh, you know, insert said playbook here, uh, but there's a community aspect to this where you can actually go back and reshare something you've already developed and built in somewhat of a generalized, um, I guess, anonymized way, but to support those who are like you that are trying to automate workloads in the same way that you are, so that you've, you've got some building blocks on top of which to build. Uh, that was one of the big draws for us uh, as we were looking at the product. And, um, and we've actually gotten a lot of, um, I guess, good triggers for other workloads that maybe we weren't really thinking about initially. Um, and so that's kind of one of the things. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah, one of the things, too, is that the, the playbooks are synchronized via Git, so Git source revision control. So you can put them on a Git repo, sync your phantom instance with those playbooks. And then we also have a GitHub repo where you can get the latest community playbooks that we put out as examples. Um, as well. So on our portal, we kind of constantly keep publishing new playbooks as you know example use cases of if you have a mix of technologies and you have a scenario, how would you go about leveraging the capabilities of the platform? So all of these playbooks on our portal under the playbook section, you can look it up by either use cases or you know threat response. I mean, WannaCry was so popular a few weeks ago. We did a four set of playbooks to say, okay, if you wanted to respond to WannaCry remediate, investigate, um, contain, how would you go about leveraging your mix of technologies as an example of um, how you would respond to it. Great. I had a question right here. Yeah, so I was looking up there, I was looking at while he was doing it, and I was looking for endpoints, and I didn't see traps. Is, is that up there? So, uh, oh, so that's, that's, that's my first question. I'll first let question. these guys answer that one. Yeah, my so, <laughs> so tra traps it's integration is um, you know, on the way. We are working towards okay. it. Right now, from Palo Network's perspective, we have integrations for autofocus, wildfire, panorama, pan, um, and we are working towards um, traps as well as uh, aperture. Okay. And my second question is, is, they, is more of an operational thing. Um, you know, I, I, some of us work for companies that have very um, thick silo walls. And um, how, what's your experience in trying to sort of make things horizontal instead of so vertical? How, and, and, in general, and then using this tool, for example, uh, Service Desk gets very, um, you know, territorial about what gets done with the end user and that sort of thing. Like, what's sure. your experience there? No, it's a, it's a good question. We, you know, I don't I don't think you're immune from that, regardless of where you work, right? I, I think for the most part, there's always some, uh, you know, th there's there there are groups who have kind of their their realm of control, and they want to, for whatever reason, I mean, maybe to, to maintain availability or whatever else. But they you know they've got they they want to maintain a sense of control over these environments. Um, Phantom, at least in our experience, and I'll let you guys answer from a platform perspective, but just in our practical uh, use cases, um, it doesn't necessitate downstream, like full personless automation. Um, a lot of times what you want to do is, is build the right context, pull the right you know, uh, uh, supporting data, um, so, you know, pull asset information, and do all of these things, and ultimately log a case or a ticket uh, to the team that you're engaging with that owns the last mile of remediation, right? Um, and in those cases, sure, if you, if you can work with that team and build automation to where end-to-end -end, um, everything is personless, great. But if you can't, and we can't, um, we ultimately pull all of that detail together in a nice package, no human intervention, and that ticket gets logged, no human intervention, uh, and the human part begins when that that uh, subsidiary group picks up the work and, and starts working on that last mile. 
Um, and that's, you know, that's kind of a general abstract use case. We do have use cases like that. In most cases, there's a human involved in some of the steps. Um, and we can talk through, I don't know if you guys want to talk through what that looks and feels like, but you can, you can either automate end to end or you can automate with uh, human interaction points uh, um, you know, at, at certain points throughout your playbook. Yeah. Does that answer your question? So I mean, th this playbook you know, need not necessarily end in, end in quarantine or remediating, right? It could all be gather all this information, it is real time, you're not two days behind in trying to get access to the device. Um, and, and it is able to collect all that information and create a ticket with all the right information. That is extremely important because as you all know and have been dealing with threats, they evolve um, you know, over a period of time and it's, the image is exactly not the way it was when it was initially infected. Um, so that is one aspect. And the other aspect is uh, for certain cases you might want to just engage the user and say, because look, I'm, I'm doing all of these um, investigations and enrichment of um, and contextualizing all the data, but the real world uh, scenario is that these services may not always be available, right? So you want to engage the user and say, okay, I have this partial set of information. Uh, what is your uh, recommendation in going forward with proceeding with this use case? And you can engage the user through the playbook itself, ask the user a question, and consume his response and carry on with the use case. And that's very important in practice. Yeah, so you can basically monitor, after I create a ticket, you can basically get the ticket and keep monitoring the state of the ticket and say within 24 hours it doesn't get remediate, it doesn't get closed, you escalate. If it doesn't get closed in a week, then you escalate further. I guess you, I mean like actually the perception check based on that host. Yeah. See that it, you know what, I just got reset, I got resolved. Yeah, absolutely. You can, you can yeah. probably, if you could do something like you create a ticket, after the ticket got resolved, you can query, panorama and get the config and see if the IP is indeed blocked or not. And if it is not blocked, then you kick another ticket off. Yeah, as, as a verification against the ticket being closed. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I've never seen that before. <laughs> well, I think you really earned the Lego sock to kit there here. <laughs> well, I'll give it to you after. <laughs> Oliver doesn't want uh, everybody anyone. to realize that he can't throw. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, you showed that uh, memory analysis is also possible through the playbooks. So uh, did, I mean, how much time does it take for the whole memory analysis playbook to run because it's like capturing and then, you know, mounting and then uh, analyzing the memory. So did you, I mean. Yeah, I think the most amount of time um, in that use case is spent in downloading the snapshot because we, the platform comes pre-provisioned with volatility. And so then, once you have the image, then running volatility actions like find malware or list connections and any kind of forensic that you want to do, that goes pretty quick. And again, it's dependent on how well resourced the uh, virtual machine is. Uh, I mean, our recommendations for typical uh, enterprise deployment is about four cores and 16 gigs of memory. Um, but again, you know, once the image has been downloaded, those actions execute fairly quickly. Okay. Uh, it's really the time spent in downloading the snapshot or uh, in triggering the snapshot. So does it also have an F response application in this? No, we don't have an F response. Um, okay. That is something that uh, yeah, we have heard. Then that would be you know, more faster. It, I, absolutely, it, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, how does it, uh, so it's a question from my colleague. So how does it handle if something breaks in the playbook? So, I mean, I, I built the playbook assuming everything is perfect, but nothing is perfect in the world. Right? <laughs> so, uh, those socks which go through a level of maturity using the platform will want to build the playbook in more steps where they have, uh, you know, code going through for success cases and failure cases. So, at any time, in, any point in time, you can basically say, if I try to hunt the file, then was the hunting successful or failed? Right, so you can say something like, you know, status is equal to success, and then proceed. Whereas if it fail, then what do you want to do? Right. Mm -hmm. So you can make your playbook as robust as possible as you want. Um, in cases of, uh, or I mean, if you had left it like this, then in case of failures, uh, because the hunt file is really not impacting any of our decision making and workflow, it would have executed on the basis of file reputation. Uh, but again, it, it is up to you how, you how complete you want the playbook <coughs> to be. We provide all the ability to take any code path depending on various states of uh, the action. Does, does last question, does this also support Fedels? 
also supports the one? Fidelis uh, platform, the incident response platform? Uh, no, oh. not, not right now. Sorry, well, which platform? Uh, Fidelis. Fidelis? Fidelis? It's Fidelis, Fidelis yeah. Oh, uh, not today. Not today. No. But, you know, it's an open platform, so if, if you want to write an app, we'd welcome it. All right, All right. We're, we're out of time. Thank you very much for coming and sticking around for the last session of the last day. We'll stick around if you guys have any other questions that you want to come up and ask. But thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you.